Okay, well, this morning we're looking at The Better Life, Part 6. So this is verse 6 out of the, the last verse in, uh, in Psalm chapter 1. And I can say that effectively we've gone through after today all six verses of Psalm 1. And, and uh, it's, it's a, what a blessing it's been to me because we've, we, we know the verses, we've read the verses, uh, we've memorized the verses. In, in our addiction program, we actually recite all six verses every Friday night because we believe it's God's plan for prosperity. And so we talk about these six verses all the time, all the time. We could probably recite them backwards in some sense. How many of you can recite them backwards? Okay, I didn't think so. But anyway, uh, we know these verses. We love these verses. We embrace them. But uh, I can honestly say that up until this, this uh, uh, study, I've never actually gone through and studied out every verse and it takes hours and hours to do that, to give yourself really, uh, you know, that's, it takes a lot of labor to, to dive in and just go through all these verses. But uh, I just really appreciate uh, this time. So I hope that you've appreciated it. And this will be the conclusion of, uh, of our series today. Let me say this, that I, I think that the better life uh, is a goal. I think it's a goal. I, never, I, I don't think it's ever really achieved. It's always just something you keep, uh, plotting after. You just keep moving along. You just keep uh, uh, plunging along for, for a, 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 this, this, uh, this goal of the better life, you know? We never really have it. And I think once we feel that we've, we have it, we, uh, well, we'll do one of two things. Either we'll uh, lose the desire to go any further or we gain a perspective and we say there's always something even better. I don't know how many of you can attest to that, when you, when you get something that's good, you say, I think now there might be something that's great. And I think the better life is that way. I think part of, um, part of uh, better, though, is knowing what is bad. And I think that there needs to be, uh, at times, a contrast so you can identify what uh, a bad example looks like, right? We've all seen a good example of a bad example, Right? And so I think that in, there are times that we need to see that contrast and it will help us to uh, plot along towards the better life. If not, we, we always remain in the status quo. We, you, you don't want the status quo. Status quo is not something you, you, you strive for. <laughs> I just want to be normal. <laughs> I mean, maybe some people want to be normal. I guess I would like to be normal in some sense. But, but we don't want the status quo when it comes to the better life. We want to to arrive there, though we never really arrive there. It's just a goal. We just keep plodding along. And uh, As we look at this last verse, what you'll notice is a contrast between the way of the godly, the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly. And that's the contrast we see here uh, in verse 6. One person said that life doesn't get better by chance, it gets better by change. And change takes time. I, I wish that I could say that uh, we, we, we just arrive at the better life just like that overnight. We read six verses, we pray about it, and we dedicate our lives just one and done, and we're just, bang, we have a better life. And, 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 and uh, while the better life has something to do with being born again, which I'll talk about in the end, um, the better life is, um, is something we still need to strive for, but it takes time. It takes time, and, and it takes a, seeing a contrast, and, and here we see that contrast in verse 6. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Psalm chapter 1, verse 6, beginning with this. Uh, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I want to camp for just a moment and talking about the first few words, for the Lord knoweth. I want to mention the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God. What is said in this verse and the whole passage is based on the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God. And that is infinite, by the way. Let me say this, that God's knowledge is infinite. And I think that the better life is a life where we acknowledge that God is infinitely mar uh, far more intelligent than we give himself, that we give him credit for. Okay, God is, is far more intelligent than we give him credit for. He knows all things for the Lord, it says in verse 6, for the Lord knoweth. 
Now, I'm not sure if there's anything uh, so sweet and so savory at the same time. Uh, there is a sweet aspect of God's uh, uh, omniscience, and that is to say his all-knowingness. I think uh, having a God that knows everything has kind of a, 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 a it's kind of a double-edged sword, if you will. Having God know everything is a, can be a good thing. And in Ecclesiastes 12.14, it says this, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You see, he knows the good deeds we've done. That is the sweet side of it. He knows the good deeds we've done. And I'll say this too, that he knows the good intentions that we've had. And many of us have had good intentions, haven't we? We always say this about somebody who we, we say, well, he, he, he did it in the right, he has, he has the right heart, right? Now we know, according to the Bible, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, but we know, it, we know what that person is implying, is that the intent of the person was good. And you know what? God knows that. God knows that. He knows the good deeds we've done, and he knows the good intent we've had. I think it's, fairly safe to say that we've all had a time in our life where we've been treated unfairly. Well, God knows that as well. And that's the time you endured grief, suffering wrongfully. How many of you in this very room have had, you've tried to have the right intent to do a good deed, and it has backfired on you? And God knows that, and that's one of the sweet things about an all-knowing God, his infinite knowledge, his infinite wisdom, is that he knows those things. But on the scary side, uh, he knows everything. <laughs> on the good side, he knows everything, and on the scary side, he knows everything. And in Psalm 90, verse 8, it says, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in light of thy countenance. Not only does he know the good deeds, but he also knows the wrong deeds, doesn't he? He not only knows the wrong deeds, but he knows the wrong thoughts that led to the wrong deeds. Now that's a scary, uh, that's, a, that, that, that's a, just a scary thing. I, I can't even hardly begin to think of how scary that is. That the God in heaven, that God in heaven knows not only our wrong deeds, but our wrong thoughts. I think every person in this room, including me, would be ashamed of themselves if, if we all knew each other's thoughts, right? If we all knew each other's thoughts, we would be ashamed at ourselves. I know I would be ashamed of myself. And God knows all of the thoughts, he knows all of the deeds, whether they're good or bad. And consequently, one of the greatest things about an omniscient God is that he's also omnipotent. He's also all-powerful, and he's all-powerful enough to forgive all of the wrong thoughts and all of the wrong deeds. And I don't know how many of you guys and gals have gone to Psalm 103 lately and just read these verses, but these are wonderful verses. It's a wonderful promise we have. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. Do I hear an amen? amen. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Now, not only do we have an infinitely wise God, an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God, but we have an infinitely merciful God. We have a God that has forgiven all of those things which we've done. Let us never forget, for the Lord knoweth. This is the wisdom of God. I'm thankful for a God who knows everything, but it certainly is scary at times. I don't know how many of you think that when you get to heaven, God's going to play back to you the things, some of the deeds you've done. Now, I sure, I sure hope not. <laughs> I sure hope not. I hope when I get there, I know Pastor Dave had mentioned something uh, a couple weeks ago when he was preaching. Um, he mentioned about no tears in heaven. And let me say this, that in Revelation, twice it's mentioned. The first time that he mentions it, 
It says that he will wipe away all tears. He does not mean that he will eliminate, eliminate them. Not in the first mention. I think it physically means that he will wipe them away from our eyes. I think there will be crying in heaven. The second mention is when he says he will wipe away all tears. I think he will eliminate tears altogether in totality. But I sure hope when I get to be before the Lord, he's not saying, Joe, I want you to look. for some, What are the big reels? The 35 millimeter, is that what they are? Like for some reason in my mind, I have this, I have this scenario where I'm sitting down watching watching this 35 millimeter reel go by and him playing back all of these things that I've done. I sure hope I'm wrong. I've never hoped I've been so wrong in my life as to right now. I hope I don't have to see that. <laughs> anyway, we've digressed. Let's talk about the way of the righteous, shall we? The way of the righteous, because for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. What does that mean? I think the way of the righteous is, uh, is wonderful and it's approved by the Lord. That means we get his, his stamp of approval on it. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, and, and he knows the way of the ungodly as well, but he knows the way of the righteous. In Jeremiah 12, 3, it says, But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried my heart toward thee. Not only does the Lord know the way of the righteous, but he tries their heart as well. He tries their heart. You know, this is not a bad thing, and you will find out a lot of things about yourself when the Lord tries you. Now, we say to ourselves, well, I just don't want to be tried of God. I don't want to be tried of God. But you will find out a lot about yourself when this happens. I've mentioned before that God is not trying to figure out who we are. He wants us to know who we are. We're not trying to um, trick God. God is omniscient. He knows all things. So why in the world would an all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful God try us? The reason? So that we can know us so that we can know us. When he does this, it will reveal things. What God wants is he wants us to have some, uh, some self-inventory going on. He wants us to, to, to look at ourselves and say, Lord, if there be any wicked thing in me, that's what he's trying to do. And consequently, there's a lot of wicked things in everyone in this room. The Lord is trying to get us to examine ourselves. You know, that's the, one of the purposes when we, when we have communion once a month and we read through uh, 1 Corinthians 11, but let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. That's what we're to do. We're supposed to go before the Lord and say, Lord, is there any wicked thing in me? Is there a wicked way in me? Am I right before the Lord? One way he does this is by trying us. And this is not chastening necessarily. When God tries you, don't think that it's always a, a, a chastening event. It seems to me that every Christian who gets tried seems to, seems to go right to this fact, this idea that what the, the Lord is chastening me. Now, listen, we're, it says, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. And that is true, but this isn't necessarily correction or chastening. He might try us, so that we can know who we are. Can I say this this morning? I want to give you four quick things about the way of the righteous. The way of the righteous is the way of the Lord. And a person who is living right has certain characteristics that define their life. And these are certain characteristics that we really want to obtain. We want to achieve these characteristics. And when a person's living godly, they'll acquire them. Let's go over a few of them. One, number one, it produces gladness. It produces gladness. Proverbs 10, 28, the hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. You know, if you choose the right way, you'll never be more glad. If you choose the right way, you'll never be more glad. On a real... Uh, a simplistic illustration of this, I don't know, uh, I know when, 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 I, when, when I get to uh, 
When I go to the store, like a Walmart, by the way, why do they have 50 lines and only three cashiers? Who can answer that for me? Anybody? Uh, you stand in line and there's, you got 20 people deep and you're just waiting and, and there's, there's, there's all of these open lines and they're all with the light off, you know? And, uh, and, and I stand, I do, uh, I, I do this game in my head. I have a game in my head that, that, I, that I play with and I, I think to myself, which line will move faster? So I start to, uh, I start to evaluate the people, the people groups. I do, I really do. I, I stand there in this line and, I'm, and I'm, I'm 10 or 15 people deep, and uh, there's another line that's 10 or 15 people deep, and I'm looking, and I'm looking in their cart, right? I'm looking in their cart, and I'm thinking, that's a lot of single items. And that's gonna, you're gonna, just going to hear bleep, 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 bleep for hours, and I think, no, and I look in front of them. Well, they don't have much. To collectively, they got 20 goods and 40 goods. Those are big items, and, and I honestly do this. I say, well, that's an old cashier. <laughs> I do it. It's horrible. Uh, it's horrible. I'm just, it's shame on me. I'm just saying what you already believe. You do this too. And then you start to run these things. It's like, okay, well, my, she, and then, or you get, you, get a, you know, I'm going to pick on the, the millennials, right? You get some kids in there, and, uh, and they just have no clue. So they're, you know, they look at the item. Have you ever had it where people talk to you about the items you buy? The very last thing you want people to do is talk about the items that you're putting in your cart, you know? So you sit there and you go, well, okay, I'm just going to take out 10 items, 20 items. It's an older cashier. This is a young cashier. Looks like he dropped out of high school. I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to figure it out, you know? And then you know what happens. Someone will be like, you know, they'll turn on one of the 48 extra lines. Or and they'll say, we can uh, open on 17. And you look over there and you're thinking, all right. You know, and the people behind you, who just got in line, of course, you know that they're going over to that line. You know, there's a real, in a real sense, the, the, the first shall be last and the last first. Like this guy, got, how did he get over there, you know? So he goes over there, and now you're starting to ask the question, like, maybe I should have gone over there. So now you're kind of stepping back, and how many of you have actually switched lines thinking one line would be quicker? Yeah, yeah. uh-huh, you know what I'm talking about. And you know you switch lines, and you're just praying. You're like, Lord... I hope that guy loses, because you're just, you're, you're, you know, it's like the guy in the orange shirt, man, I just got out from behind that guy, and I just don't want to, and you're just, you're asking yourself these questions, like, man, I don't know, and, uh, and then you got, you, and then you know you're getting up close, this is the worst, you're getting up close, you're, you're smiling, you're all kind of cocky, like, oh, man, I'm, I'm ahead of this guy, you know, he was behind me, I'm ahead of him, you know, and, and then you get up there, and then they turn that dumb Ding, and then the thing, you know, the light goes on and it starts blinking and you're thinking, you've got to be kidding me, this guy is going to win after all. I should have gone in the line over on line 17 that was open, you know? And, but if you're like me, you like to win, right? So I'm looking at this thing, it's almost a game because that's the only thing you can think of is this has got to be a joke, right? So, so it's, it's a game and, and you finally get up there and you're like, yeah, I beat everybody. Yeah, all right, all right. And you just love picking the right path, don't you? And doesn't it, don't you just have kind of a gladness about you? Where you're just glad? Well, Christianity is the same way. Living a godly life, a righteous life, is very similar to that. Where when you do what you should be doing, and you're living a godly life, you have gladness. And that's what this is. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. You'll be glad that you got there. Secondly, secondly, it produces boldness. Not just gladness, but boldness. In Proverbs 28.1, it says that the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The righteous are bold as a lion. Now, boldness and, and confidence is the disposition of a righteous person. It's the disposition of a righteous person. And boldness or confidence is, isn't a bad thing. I mean, in some cases it can be. You understand that uh, confidence in it, it can become a bad thing. It can become arrogance. You know what I'm talking about? But, but generally speaking, when I talk about boldness in this sense, it's a disposition of someone who is, um, who is righteous. It produces boldness. Uh, someone once said, confidence isn't walking into a room thinking you're better uh, than, than everyone, it's walking in and not having to compare yourself to anyone at all. 
It's not walking in and saying that I'm better than you all. It's saying that I can walk in and say, I don't have to compare myself to you. And that's okay. And you can be bold and you can be confident. You see, the wicked, the wicked are always looking over their shoulder, aren't they? They're always wondering if somebody's got them. They're always wondering if they're in trouble. I think everyone in this room has done that at some point in time in their life. They're wondering if they're in trouble. I had a, I had a classmate when I was going to Bible college. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, before he went to Bible college, he was a drug dealer. I mean, legitimately, he was a drug dealer. Okay? He'd go on the streets and he'd peddle his drugs. And in conversations with him, he would say it was the scariest thing because to me, everybody was a cop. He said that there was always somebody that was trying to get me. And he says it was, it was paranoia. Everybody wasn't a cop. Everybody wasn't trying to get him. There were a lot of people trying to get his drugs. But just because somebody comes up and they look a little suspicious doesn't mean that they're a cop and they're trying to get you. And he would tell, tell me this story. And this right here, this verse, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, is an exact um, it's, a, it's an example of that. He's always looking over his shoulder thinking, am I going to get caught? Am I going to get in trouble? But you know what? It says that the, that the righteous are bold as a lion. The righteous are bold. They're not concerned with every little thing because they've got nothing to hide. They've got nothing to hide. So not only does it produce boldness, three, it produces life while you're living. It produces life while you're living. In Proverbs 12, 28, it says, in the way of righteousness is life. In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. Now, I think in general, this is, in, that this is life in general, that this is just uh, not just a physical life. Uh, I, I've heard people say at times that I'm living I'm alive, but I have no life. Do you know what I'm talking about? They just seem to be just going along, just going through the motions, and, and I think that the person, this person who is righteous, it produces a life worth living. They actually have something. They actually have a, a life. Now, I think it will keep people alive as well. A righteous person, I think, lives longer in general than someone who is unrighteous. You think about someone who's living wickedness and living an unrighteous life, who is caught up in, in, in all sorts of just, just wicked things. I mean, let's just face it. The person who, who isn't wicked is going to live longer than the person who is. With the exception of, maybe, some of the people like martyrs who have been burned at the stake for their righteousness. Now, can I say this, though, that I think that they probably lived longer because of their righteousness, though they were burned at the stake, had they not been righteous at all. Now, God only knows that. The better life is lived by the righteous people. Okay, so that was third. It produces life while you're living. Now, fourth... Fourth, it produces joy for your journey. It produces joy for your journey. In Psalm uh, 16, verse 11, Thou will show me thy, the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Not just joy. Can I say this this morning? Not just joy, but fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Billy Sunday said once, he said, if you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. God's purpose, one of his purposes, is not only to get the glory for himself, but for you to live a life that's full of joy. And how many times are we robbed of our joy? Today, there are many Christians that don't have the joy God so desperately wants to give and it's sad today to see how many Christians lack fullness of joy. They lack fullness of joy. And I think the reason they know they lack fullness of joy is because they at times can see it in themselves. And I think at times they can see it in others. 
And they say, that person right there has full joy in their life. They have joy for their journey. Nobody wants to live a life that has no joy. Nobody, none of us want to live a life where we just always need something else to fill the void. We want joy for our journey. So point two, point one, is God knows everything. The wisdom of God. Point two was the way of the godly. And point three is the way of the ungodly. The way of the ungodly. And in Psalm 10, verse 4 to 7, it says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. Wow, when I read that, I'm just blown away. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. It says this, that God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far, are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. The ungodly live a life that is so proud and is so self-confident that they will never get caught. They will never be in adversity. They're not going to be moved. They don't need to trust God. They trust themselves and their wicked ways so much that there is an arrogance about them. That they become proud about who they are in light of who God is and they don't need God after all. They can do this by themselves. The ungodly way of living is a horrible way of living and it's littered with all sorts of doubt and suspicion. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. They don't have the peace that we have. They don't have boldness in the courage. They don't have gladness and they don't have joy for their journey. I think everyone in this room has done something wrong at some point in time. And we talked a little bit about this in Sunday school. I would venture to guess that everybody in this room has at least done one thing in their life that they are ashamed of doing. And that if we all knew about it, they would be ashamed. Now God knows about it, but what if we all knew about it? We are in a dire situation. There is a way of the ungodly that is not the better life. The better life is a life free from being a prisoner to a guilty conscience. I hate having a guilty conscience. You know, when we are, when we, when we are in our addiction program setting, it's just like a, like a ton of bricks off your chest when you confess your sin and get right. You know that? When someone says, man, I did this and I am so sorry for it, I just want to get right before God. I really think that the better life is a life free from being a prisoner to a guilty conscience. Nothing is worse than a guilty conscience. Proverbs 15.9 says that the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. There's nothing that the Lord dislikes as much as wickedness. It's all an abomination to Him. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Boy, if you, had to, if you asked me uh, 30 years ago, I would have been 8 years old. That means I'm 38. Anyway, if you were to ask me 30 years ago how you, would, how you could plan, if you could plan your steps, what would they look like? 
I'm not sure I would have planned them the way that, I, not today. I'm not sure I would have gotten out a piece of paper and, and said, okay, let me just look at this real quick and let me just make some notes here. I think that I'm going to be a pastor of a church and have a wife and two kids and uh, every Sunday morning I'm going to be eager to go to church. <laughs> I would have never put that on the list. Are you kidding me? I was eight years old. I can't even remember when I was eight. What was I doing when I was eight? How many of you remember when you were eight? Well, see, they raised their hand. It's like last year. <laughs> there are some people that can remember all those things. I can't even remember. I, I, but I would not put it on a list that says, I am excited to go to church, and I am disappointed in my life when I don't get a chance to go to church. I tell you, I would have never put that on the list. What do you want for Christmas? My two front teeth. No, I'm kidding. I wouldn't put that on the list. I want to, I want to make sure that I go to church every Christmas. What, what, what are some of the biggest things that are going to be a disappointment in your life? Well, one of them wouldn't be, I didn't get a chance to go to church. You know, the way of the... The way of the ungodly. The ungodly are the ones that perish. They're the ones that don't have what we as Christians have. I tell you, there is a, there is a, there is a, a, a sense of pity. And it's just true pity for those that do not know the Lord. And that do not know the fact that God has forgiven them for all of their sin. You know, when I have a guilty conscience before the Lord, I make my way to the throne of grace and I say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. And it's, and it's over. And you want to live a better life, it's free from that guilty conscience. And we can go to God and we can ask forgiveness. We can get right with him. And it's that simple. Now, I'm not saying there's not going to be a, a residue of 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 guilt in your life and, and that's why we can keep going back to God and keep asking Him and say, Lord, we know that You forgave us. I want You to restore to me the joy of my salvation. Create in me a clean heart, Lord. I want to be right before You. I want to I wanna love You like, like, the, like the prophets loved You. I want to love You like David loved You. It was a man after your own heart. That's the guy I want to be. We can go to God and we can do that. What a blessing it is. You know, we have a better life. We have a much better life. But the better life begins by being a better person. And how do we do that? It's by being born again. It's about being born again. It's about living a new life in Christ. And I tell you, there's nothing so miraculous as that. I love seeing a soul saved. That's a, that's, that's a miracle. Regeneration. A new birth. Being born again, that's a miracle. When you, see a, when you see a soul saved, when you get a chance to lead someone to Jesus Christ, and, and, and you see that happen, we can look at that and say, that is an absolute miracle. You know, sometimes we can't identify miracles, can we? We say, well, it's... It's such a miracle that it didn't snow 15 inches, you know. It's like, well, is it really, you know? I mean, for the guy out there plowing, that'd be a miracle for him. So how can we identify a miracle? Let me tell you, it happens every time someone places their faith in Christ alone as their Savior. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Do you know why? Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And when I, see a, when I see a new birth happen, when I see regeneration happen, when I see a soul saved, I get excited about that. That's a miracle. You have to be born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. I'd say back in the uh, 60s and 70s, and some of you folks who are older than me, <laughs> you could chime in here. There was a, a movement back in the, I want to say, 60s and 70s. And, and the word born again was, was kind of thrown around, am I right? Just say yes if it was. Yes, okay. It was kind of thrown around. It was kind of a, a term that was almost, uh, 
uh, spoken ill of by some even Bible believers because being born again just, just, just meant something different than what it really truly means in the Bible. The Bible, what it means born again, it means trusting Christ as your Savior that he died for your sin. You're born again. When you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, you're born again. You have a, a new life. It's wonderful. And you know, I know it sounds cliche-ish, but man, that is why I give the gospel every single Sunday. I don't want anybody leaving the room not knowing where they're going when they die. You know what somebody once said? Live every moment like it's your last. Because one day you'll be right. And so we have to know where we're going when we die. And we have to share that gospel with people. We have to share that with people. And that's why I use this hand to represent you and me in this wall to represent sin. Somebody says, but you know everybody in here is saved. I believe everybody in this room is saved. But can I say this this morning? That if I didn't do that every time I knew that somebody was saved, the people that are saved would minimize the importance of it. I don't do this to try to get you to be saved. Do you know that? I don't do this to try to prove to myself something about salvation. I do this to show you the importance. So next time you can say, well, like, like, I know Pastor Joe, he gives that every single Sunday. Amen to that. Because if I didn't, you'd forget it. And then you'd, you'd say, well, I brought this guy to church, but Pastor Joe never gave the gospel. <laughs> and that'd be a heartbreak, wouldn't it? This hand right here represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin, this sin is death. It's not, <clears throat> not turning over a new leaf. It's not living a righteous life. Now the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. And it's approved of God, yes. But you can't be righteous enough to get yourself to heaven. Righteousness is imputed to you. It's given to you by God. It's not about giving money to the church. It's not about getting baptized. It's about a death. Someone had to die because the wages of sin is death. And Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for our sin. That's so wonderful. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a gift given to you when you believe that he died, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day and now he looks at you and me as righteous as he looks at, as he looks at Christ. That's a miracle. It's a fabulous miracle. And let us never forget that. I can only imagine... <clears throat> all the Egyptians <clears throat> and all Israel standing on the bank of the Red Sea asking themselves is this, a, is this a natural event? Did this just happen? And of course we look back and say no idiots that was a miracle by God he did that he spread it just like he did with the Jordan he's, he's God he can do anything he wants to do it's, it's a miracle. But let me tell you what when I, when I see a soul saved when I see a new birth happen to an old body, that's a miracle just that fast. And we need to share that gospel with people. And we need to have boldness, don't we? Can I say that this morning, that we need to have boldness to do that? We ought never to be ashamed of the gospel. Now that doesn't mean we have to be rude and we don't have to be mean, you know? You don't have to you know, beat someone in the head you got to love them enough to share the good news with them. Jesus died on the cross for them. And then you get to witness a miracle. You say, I, people say, I've never seen a miracle. Go lead someone to Christ. And you'll see a miracle. And it's the most spectacular miracle you'll ever see. I'd put it up against watching the Red Sea part. Mm -hmm.